Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Creepy Encounters. We are going to be joined today by Silver Underworld Scary Stories. Go subscribe to his channel. The YouTube link will be in the description down below. But now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. This story was from Reddit user Ralph Wright's title name. Who pretended to be my dad? I was about 12 years old in sixth grade and lived in the South. At the same time, the town's population was around 20,000. But when the local university was in session, it would nearly double. It wasn't a place where everyone inevitably knew everyone else. But if you played 20 questions with each other... You could undoubtedly find people you both knew. My single mother and I lived in an apartment downtown and had been there for around eight months. It was summertime, and as she worked and attended college, I was usually home around during the day. This was in the early 90s. About halfway through the summer, a girl from my school, Maria, moved into the house about a block away from us. I didn't know Maria that well, and... It wasn't until she moved in that I really started spending a lot of time with her. I did not know her parents and they didn't know my mom. When this event occurred, we had been hanging out for maybe a couple of weeks, riding the bikes, going to the library together. Her mother and stepfather worked all day too, so we were mostly alone. Then one day, I was at her house when her mom was home. Maria and I were out in the yard when her mom came to the door and hollered at me. She was like, Hey, did your dad ever manage to find you? Which to me was super weird. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. She said. Your dad called here a couple of days ago and asked if you were at our house. He said he couldn't find you. I was stunned and had no idea what she was talking about. To Maria's mom, a virtual stranger. The call probably made sense to those who knew me, though it was wild. The actual people who knew me knew that my dad had never lived with me. In fact, he lived a couple of hours away in a different county, and at that point in my life, I can count the number of times he had been to my house on one hand. There was no animosity or drama there. You could see me wherever you wanted but we were not close. He'd never been in the town in which I was living in. I hadn't seen him probably about six months and seeing how we didn't have a phone, we hadn't recently spoken. He had no idea Maria even existed. He never met any of my friends. My mom hadn't even met Maria yet or her parents. So I was a little freaked out and asked, um, are, are you sure it was me he was looking for? She was like, Yes. He apparently recited my full name, middle and all, and described me, including my recent haircut and glasses. My dad had never seen my glasses. Didn't even know I wore them. I'd only had them for a week. She said he asked if she knew where I was, that he couldn't find me, and she told him to try my apartment. He apparently said, Okay, and hung up. Well, so, of course, I went straight to a payphone and called my dad as soon as I left. And, of course, he had no idea what I was talking about. In fact, it bothered him. To this day, I have no idea what that was about. Was it a prank call or someone coincidentally looking for their daughter of the same name and physicality? And Maria's mom was like, thought it was me? Or like some guy actually tried to abduct or stalk me. But in that case, how did he know to call Maria's house? He wouldn't need to know Maria's parents' last name, for one thing. And her mother had just got remarried. 
her last name was different. And what was the point? I was often alone. I was probably easily adductable. <laughs> I know, um, not the word at the time. Nothing like that ever happened to me again. But a few weeks later, I did get a really strange feeling after coming home from the used bookstore. I had just gone upstairs and unlocked my apartment door when something like trepidation hit me with full force. The living room looked fine. I didn't see or hear anyone, but I got the strongest sense that someone had just been in my room just seconds before. When I tried to step forward, every hair on my body just stood up. I didn't question it. Just slammed the door, ran down the stairs, and stayed in the library until my mom got off work. Maria's family moved away a few weeks later, but we were there for another year. As far as I know, nothing else happened. ETA. I just did a Facebook Live video with my mom about this to see if she remembered anything else. She not only remembered it, but also said that she had gone and talked to Maria's parents at the time. I didn't know that. Apparently the guy that had asked if there were any places I might be like he was fishing for information. The biggest thing though is that he asked using my full name. My dad never used that name. The only person in the world who calls me by a certain nickname, a shortened version of my longer name. My 11 year old brain theorized that maybe he was plain abducting me and called Maria's house. My 11 year old mind theorized that maybe he was planning to abduct me and call Maria's house posing as my dad so that when I disappear, my dad would be the suspect. He may have known just about enough about me to know that my parents are separated, but not enough to understand certain details like my nickname or my parents' situation. Hey guys, I was just reminded of this really scary incident involving a manager at one of the old jobs that I had. This happened about five years ago when I was 20. I believe he was around 42 or so give or take a few years plus or minus. To paint you a picture here, the manager in question, who we'll call Tim, was a short Viking-esque guy. Red beard, red hair, bright blue eyes, stocky build, not muscular though. Tim was also a heavy smoker and a known racist. He'd drop the N-word at least four times a week for shock factor during conversations. He also used to refer to indigenous people as Indians. He stopped once he found out that I was Midas and confronted him about it. He was mostly bark with little bite, but still, someone I was cautious around nonetheless. He also had a girlfriend who was also 20 at the time. She was like an alternate reality version of me. Like me, she was a bigger girl, size 24, 26-ish. Piercings, tattoos, the works. I looked like the replicant tall version of her. It was surreal. He never outright told me that he had feelings for me, but on several occasions he'd comment on how much I reminded him of his girlfriend and would ask if I was into women in three ways. I was bisexual. He didn't know that though. I gave vague answers every time he asked something of that sort, but one day he made an off comment about bisexual women being greedy, to which I reacted negatively to. He put the pieces together from there. A couple weeks went by of him asking me questions about my interests, my hobbies, what I do in my off time, my favorite music, etc. Normally I'd chalk this up to office banter, but with the creepy undertones, I had a hard time engaging him about my personal life. At this time, I had also started seeing my now partner of five years. When my boss asked again what I was doing after work, I informed him I was going to see my boyfriend. This sent him into a question tailspin. He asked me how we met, how long we'd been dating, where he lived even. It was really unnerving. Once again, I kept the answers vague, but this time I went on and on about how much I love my partner and how excited I was to have such an amazing partner in my life. I wanted to be crystal clear that I was not interested in my boss. 
That same evening as we were closing, he told me about his favorite music. He specifically mentioned a band called Immortal Technique and a song of theirs called Dance with the Devil. I shrugged as I wasn't familiar with the song, so he put it on on the store's speakers while we swept and I closed cash. For those of you who aren't familiar with that song, it's a very graphic and disturbing song that has a rather intense twist at the end. If you like the song, that's your taste, whatever. But personally, as a woman, I find it difficult listening to graphic depictions of extreme violence against women, period. Before continuing, I'd suggest you read through some of the lyrics of the song, specifically the last half, as it pertains to this story. Tim turns up the music to an almost deafening level while I count out the cash and get our computers closed up. As he's sweeping, he actively and loudly is rapping along word for word, dropping in bombs of course all the way through. He hadn't been looking at me until the lighter half of the song, where the lyrics begin to depict a woman being R-worded and killed by a group of men. It's visceral, violent, and terrifying. Tim turns to me at the point of the song and stares into my eyes while pointing and dancing to the lyrics, while still rapping along. He was making violent gestures while doing so. For example, motioning a head-stopping gesture with his hands, thrusting during the R-word, etc., I quickly closed cash faster than I ever had in my life. I felt like I was in danger at this point. I grabbed my bag and jacket as the song finished. He turned it off and goes, Isn't that something? It's poetry. The storytelling is just amazing, isn't it? I remember my whole body was tense. I muttered, not my cup of tea, and left. I should have given him my notice right then and there, but I was in a rough employment situation and couldn't up and leave. After that, though, he actually stopped scheduling him and I together very often, and about a month later, I gave my notice after finding a better job full-time. He was furious when I left, of course. The company actually ended up closing that location a few months later because Tim lost it, according to our common connection, a friend of mine and a worker of his. This friend of mine also told me he upped and moved to the other side of the country to be with his ex-wife. Yikes. What made me remember this story was that a few months ago, I was running errands in the outskirts of my city. I happened to stop by a random Taco Bell, and guess who walks in with a very young-looking woman on his arm? Tim. I was with my partner, who also recognized him when they made eye contact. My partner and I were already seated and eating by this point. Tim looked at us like a deer in the headlights and booked it out of there faster than a kite in the wind. Before he left, though, I noticed he had shaved his head and got some suspicious looking tattoos on his arms. When he turned around, there was a distinct white power symbol patch on his jacket and his girlfriend's jacket as well. So not only was this guy a creep, but also a predator and now a white supremacist. I don't go to that area anymore unless I'm accompanied by my partner at all times. Tim is very much a part of my past and I have no desire to ever run into him again. Thanks for reading. Feels good getting that off my mind and onto paper, so to speak. I literally just made this profile for the purposes of typing this story out. I look to gain nothing from it. All I really want to do is raise awareness of some of the creepy things that go on. I see far too many dating app horror stories. I'm a 23 year old female. I've been single for a while. I go out on dates very rarely, but I just recently moved to a new city. I've been struggling with loneliness from not knowing anyone, and I don't really have any friends from work yet. So I took to things like Bumble and Tinder after maybe a week of swiping, I eventually came across a guy that I matched with. He was really cute, had a good job, had similar interests as me, and we were the same age. I should have known better. We talked for about a week. After a couple of days, we exchanged numbers. We talked about life. We talked about our jobs. He was really sweet. He gave me assurance and told me that a new move could be scary but that putting myself out there was a good step in the right direction. He did get strange with me at one point and asked me things like what collar bra and underwear I was wearing. 
I told him I wasn't quite ready to talk like that. He agreed it was out of line and apologized. Didn't think much else of it. After about a week, he wanted to meet up in person. He wanted it to be in a public place so that I would feel safe. He told me he would take me to dinner, and if I wanted after, we could grab a beer. It sounded like a fun night to me. He wanted to meet outside of a dive shop, which I thought was a little strange. It's winter here where we are, but it's one of these U.S. states that doesn't really see cold winters, so I didn't give it a great amount of thought. The shop is located near a public park, so there were a good amount of people there. After looking around for a bit, I spotted him talking to some people. I walked up to him and gave him a hug. Not like super romantic, but more than platonic. Less than a partner kind of hug. To my disappointment, he just sort of arched his palms on my back. Like he was put off. But he did give me a slight smile and a, how are you? I tried making it work. I told him he looked a lot cuter in person and that I was happy that he asked me out. I was extremely nervous. His eyes widened and he turned to ask the group he was previously talking to who put me up to it. With no expression of humor, they all just calmly denied anything. He then asked me who told me to do this. I was confused. I told him that we had been talking on Tinder. He told me he didn't have a Tinder and even went as far as showing me that he didn't have it downloaded. He apologized for the mix up. I showed him the profile and he seemed equally confused. I turned away and started walking back to my car. I was so humiliated. Then I got a text message from the number I had been talking to that simply read, ha 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 ha. I could not even fathom that. I attempted to call the number, but it had been disconnected. By the time I got home, the profile had been deleted. I blocked the number just in case. I had some of the photos that the profile sent me. I did a reverse image search on Google and found the Facebook profile of the guy that I actually met. His name wasn't the same and he was actually a few years older. I also figured out he was a dive instructor at the shop. I felt so betrayed and violated. I did send the guy a message, the actual one, and apologized for the inconvenience. I explained everything to him and why I was acting that way. I gave him as much of the story as I found necessary. To my surprise, he actually responded back and said he was sorry that he was blindsided by the encounter. He did offer to take me out for a drink to make up for the mess, but I simply have severe trust issues now. The actual encounter was brief but terrifying. I'm a 30-year-old female, and I live with my wife and our sweet orange tabby cat. We own a home in an older neighborhood in a college town. The neighborhood is mostly families and older people. Right around 2 a.m., Monday morning, my wife and I are both woken up by our cat. Immediately after we hear him, we distinctly hear someone rattling our door. To make the sound, they would have had to be holding the handle and trying to open it. We rush to the living room. My wife, wielding her aluminum bat, smacks our leather recliner and screams, I have an effing bat. Our cat is crouched on the ground and growling, his hackles raised. I got 911 on the line, and we all got into our one bedroom with a lock while we wait for the police. They came by and didn't see anything. That night, my wife didn't get any more sleep. I only got a little myself after our cat curled up next to me. We both called out of our jobs at the university on Monday and wound up getting lock bars for the front and back door and replaced the back door lock with one that requires a key on both sides. This thankfully went as well as it could have, but was so out of the blue and upsetting. More than anything, this is just a reminder to stay vigilant and invest in what security measures you can. We never imagined someone would try to break in during the dead of night when there are two cars in the driveway. Could this be the same guy or someone playing with me? Okay, so like two or three years ago when I started dating, 
Tender. There was this one guy I was chatting with, and we bonded because I ride a longboard and he skates too. He was an older white guy, but lived close enough to know my neighborhood. He said he has been ghosted, and if I don't like him, just tell him. So I started liking this other guy, my current boyfriend, and didn't feel right to plan a date with this guy, so I told him. He went off and I blocked him. Then he started texting me from other numbers, and they all got blocked. So fast forward to current times. I get a random WhatsApp message of a man saying he got my number from Tinder, and they knew my actual name. I go by my alias, so he knew my name and spelled it right. I let the guy down and then blocked once he kept texting. Then I got another number on WhatsApp, and it's the same guy, and he's calling me a B-word for blocking him, and he's going to finish on my face, and he sent me a lewd picture. The guy is white, and the only person I could think of that's this crazy. I blocked him again. I was weirded out. My boyfriend thinks it might be my ex. Another story. Crazy dude. But I don't think it is. I don't know who else it could be. Now, I'm already looking over my shoulder because of my ex, now this other person. It sucks, because everyone in my neighborhood knows me, and he knows my neighbor. This is one of those situations in which we'll probably never know what was really going on. It's haunted us for years. My mom and I were on our way to Nashville, and we'd stopped over the Kentucky line at one of those big off-ramp service stations. Thank pilots, loves, etc. for a bathroom break. She and I were in different stalls, and not long after we were situated, I heard the door open again. I couldn't see them, but it sounded like the footsteps of a woman and a child. They went into the handicap stall together, and though the child never said a word, the woman never stopped talking. It wasn't her incessant chattering that grabbed my attention, though. It was what she was saying. You're beautiful, little girl. Do you know that? Aren't you the prettiest girl in the world? Mama. Can you say mama? I'm your mama. Mama. You are just so sweet and beautiful. You really are. They were only in there for a minute or so. I could hear her blathering on at the sinks, but when I flushed the toilet and opened the door, she quickly grabbed the little girl by the hand and pulled her out. I got a good look at the child, but only saw the woman from the back. I felt deeply unsettled. I'm standing there, washing my hands, mulling over what happened when mom joined me. I felt kind of silly, like I was overreacting, but then my mom goes, were you listening to that? Yes, I was so glad she felt it too. Wasn't that weird? We talked about it for a few seconds and wondered if we should tell someone. But what would we say? Nothing bad had happened. The child hadn't looked or acted scared. Back in the store, nobody was frantically running around searching for their child. There were video cameras up that would have caught most everything. The woman had been strange, but it didn't feel like she was hiding the child or on a time crunch. We grabbed drinks and paid. But as we got out to the car, we saw them again. As it turned out, they were parked right next to us, and we couldn't get in until they closed their doors. This time, they were accompanied by a middle-aged, unkempt man. He was barking orders at them, trying to move them along, and the little girl was staring down at her shoes. She looked sad. When he saw us standing at our car, he glared and muttered under his breath. But I didn't know if that was for our benefit or theirs. Their car was full of crap. The rear window was packed full of papers, clothes, and garbage, and the passenger side back seat had clothes on hangers dangling in front of the window. There was very little room in the back for the girl. The couple ushered her into the car and then quickly hung a blanket on the other window, effectively blocking her from view. Nobody from the outside could see into the back seat where the child was setting. They pulled out of there like a bat out of hell, but I managed to memorize the license plate I wasn't even consciously trying to. Everything just happened so fast. Mom pulled out a piece of paper and we jotted it down, as well as the make, model, and color of the vehicle. At first we felt silly calling the police because, after all, we were still going on feelings. They hadn't really done anything wrong, although the rear window obstruction could have gotten them in trouble. 
people can do things that look crazy out of context. We did call, though. The local police turned us over to the state police who took our information, but they didn't want to come and talk to us any further. In fact, they acted a little put out over the call. After telling them the story, we felt like the weird ones, or Karens before we called them Karen. I was embarrassed, but it still felt right. Once we reached Nashville, we actually watched the news, wondering if we'd see any reports about an abduction. Nothing. I've done a few searches over the years, but haven't uncovered anything or anyone who would have physically matched the age or gender of the child. I felt conflicted about calling the police because it felt so invasive. I'm generally a stay-in-your-own-lane kind of person. Chances are that this was an innocent situation. New foster parents, adoptions, or just weird people doing weird stuff. But still, I wonder. And also, just to add, this happened around 2000 or 2001, so many years ago. Tonight, my significant other got a phone call from someone using no caller ID and who I can only assume was using a voice changer as they sounded like a very young child slash girl. For the sake of keeping us as distant as possible from this person following our online posts, I will be referring to my SO as Saul. They asked if they had reached Saul and we responded yes. They asked odd questions and knew personal details about my significant other asking questions about the family's prior workplaces, our dog's name. Neither me or my significant other post on socials often, and we have never posted this dog's name aside from some Snapchat videos. The road we live on and the type of car we drive. We've already ruled out potential friends who we thought may have been pranking us. When they ended the call, they said, okay, bye, see you later. Any ideas? Won't be sleeping tonight. So many feedback is appreciated. I wasn't sure if I should post this here, or even if it counts, but after talking it over with a few people, I figured I would if just to spread information and to warn others. This encounter happened a week ago last Tuesday afternoon. I'm a 30 year old female and I was catching up on chores and last minute shopping on my day off. I was actually on my way home and had stopped at a gas station to fill up so I wouldn't have to worry about it the next day before work. Now, the gas station I had stopped at is usually pretty dead, but it's a decent size with like 24 pumps, I believe. Because of the direction I was headed, I parked at the very last pumps furthest from the building on the inside. At the time, there were maybe half a dozen other people at the complete opposite end, with about four pillars slash eight empty pumps between us. I honestly wasn't paying much attention to anyone until this old, beat up looking white panel van pulled up to the outside pump on the other side of mine. Now, I'll admit, I'm a huge true crime nerd, as in started reading true crime novels at like age 11 and got a lot of notes home to my parents for it, but that's a different story. So that sight instantly put me on edge. I tried my best to remain casual, but kept my attention on the van, and tried to move in a way the pump wasn't blocking my escape route. Now I was positioned towards the side of the pump closest to the building, keeping the pump between me and the stranger, when this middle-aged looking man walked towards the other end of the pump, and close to me to try to get my attention. I didn't get closer but did lean forward to listen to him. He kind of quietly asked if I could help him with some gas. I mentioned quietly because I had to lean forward more and ask him what. So he would repeat himself. He didn't get closer and almost stuttered asking if I could help him with gas, staying on the far end of the pump from me. My first thought was he was asking for money, so I told him I had no cash. He was very clean looking and well-groomed, so I thought it was kind of odd that he'd be asking for money. He repeated he just needed help with gas, and kind of motioned to the pump. The whole situation just felt weird. He never asked for money, just kept saying help with gas. 
and it was at that moment I started to think he was actually wanting me to go to his side of the pump. He was parked in a way the van doors were right next to the pump, and he had made a point to not stand in front of them. I noticed he was positioned in a way he would likely have been blocked by any cameras, and at that moment, I knew if he was trying to steal my card or grab me, I would have been completely blocked from any cameras, and we were far enough away from other people and next to a busy highway that no one would hear me if I yelled. Honestly, I was almost thinking I was being kind of a dick, and what if he really needed help? But I couldn't shake off the feeling of something being wrong. I took two steps back, making it obvious that I was putting distance between us, and flat out said no, and went back to looking at my pump. Any guilt I felt instantly vanished when he got back to his van and drove away. Mind you, there were still half a dozen people on the other side that he could have asked. He could have gone inside to ask someone there. So why only ask one person and then leave? I'm convinced it was a grab-and-go attempt that failed, and so he bailed before any more attention was on him. I can't think of any other reason, especially if he needed to gas up a van. Why waste gas driving away before exhausting your chances of asking other people? And I know he didn't come to me last because I watched him pull in. Now I do know that there is a chance that he could have really needed help and I was just being a jerk. But as a lone woman, I'd rather be a jerk than dead. I'm posting this here as a PSA in a sense. If you're out and about on your own, do not put yourself in situations where you are alone. I have always tried to go to the quiet slash empty places because I hate crowds, but I can see now how that can be dangerous. Just bite the bullet and deal with the crowd. The more witnesses, the less likely someone will try something. I wasn't going to post this to Reddit at first, because I do find my own situation hard to believe in itself so I can see why others might not believe it at all. But then I realized it doesn't matter, and I need advice. Also, I'm a 25-year-old woman if that helps. Firstly, this occurred two weeks ago, hence my question in the title. I live in a kind of big house with my dad who lives at the opposite end. Our house is at the end of a driveway with three homes sharing this driveway. The important context here is that my neighbor in front of my house is a drug dealer. I've lived here my entire life, and he's been dealing drugs down there my entire life as well. Two weeks ago on a Thursday evening around 8.30 p.m., I'm in my bedroom, which is located closely to my front door to my house. Suddenly, I see lights in my window and look out the curtains to see an old blue and green pickup truck slowly driving up my driveway and stopping near my window. I thought it could have been a late delivery person, but it was strange that they were in an old truck and this late at night. I had the TV on loud and was getting dressed to go and see if there is a delivery when I hear a man's voice inside my home. I couldn't make out what he was saying. I'm in my room with my doors closed and he's in the next room, my living room. I wasn't freaked out at first because I thought it was my dad coming to tell me that someone was here. I started yelling over the TV, Dad, is that you? Dad, because I couldn't hear what the person was saying and I was trying to find the remote to turn down the TV. Now the TV is turned down, and I hear the words delivery, and can I come in, coming from right outside my bedroom door. I'm scared now, because now I know it isn't my dad, and probably not a delivery person either. This person literally started turning the doorknob to my bedroom door as I was running to get my paper spray. He never opened the door. I had the pepper spray held at a man's eye level as I opened the door, ready to blast him, and run to the end of my house to wake up my dad. He didn't come because he was asleep. But there was no one there when I opened my bedroom door. And now my front door was shut. I go get my dad, and he comes into the living room and we watch out the window as the truck slowly backs up into my neighbor's driveway. He sat there for a minute with his lights on, and me and my dad just watched. It was dark, and there was no way to see his license plate. He left very slowly after just a minute or so, but it was so strange he even stayed. I didn't call the police because I was told by people around me it was pointless because there's nothing they could do. 
But now that I'm thinking more about it, I do have a description of the vehicle. And what he did was illegal, right? My door must have been accidentally left unlocked. But I don't think that means you can just walk in. I'm thinking of calling and just reporting it. Just so there is something written on paper about this. Oh, and obviously there was no package left. I would appreciate any advice. Edit. Okay, so I know they won't be able to do much, but I am going to call in the morning anyway and just report what happened regardless. I'm also going to ask the drug dealer about the truck because he's an old man that is disabled. I've known him for years and I'm not scared to speak to him outside his house. Hopefully he knows the truck or person. Thank you for making me realize that this is something that should be reported and not ignored. I knew it in my heart. Appreciate you. I'll try to be as short as possible. So my boyfriend's uncle lives two to three hours from us, so we barely see each other. Maybe once or twice a year. He's giving off weird vibes, I guess. Not necessarily super creepy at first, but definitely weird. I noticed him checking me out sneakily, but I've been the victim of SA a few times in my life, and I brush it off as me being overly cautious or sensitive. The way he talks and his accent are quite unique, and you recall it pretty easily, even without knowing him better. I know he was an addict to alcohol in the past, but he claims he's sober now. So this happened twice, last year and the year before. Mind you, I have social anxiety, so unknown callers are a huge issue for me. The year before, rather quick event. Unknown number called and a male voice very similar to his asked me if I'm fine and what I'm doing right now. I was immediately stressed out and kept stuttering until he said he had to hang up. Though it was super weird, I brushed it off and forgot about it after a few days. Last year. Last year the phone rang around nighttime, 9 to 10 p.m. Very unusual. Only a few family members call us in general and never that late. Since it was unknown number and my mom calls with unknown number, I picked it up, thinking it was her, not even remembering that creepy call I got a year beforehand. There was a male voice, speaking with the same accent, rather unusual where I live, and sounding very similar to him, but with slurred speech as if he was drunk. I panicked and didn't ask for his name, which I regretted later. Once again, he called me by my name, asking how I've been and saying he missed me. At this point, my anxiety is through the roof and I'm nearly crying. I now remember the last call, but I'm not able to ask any questions that would confirm his identity because I'm freezing at this point. He was breathing heavily and kept talking, which was hard to understand. He then asked me if I was bored and if I'm alone right now, as he'd love to visit me. I immediately said, no, my boyfriend is here. And he answered, what a pity, only to hang up again. He didn't call me again, but this still lives in my head, not gonna lie. I avoided him when he visited and tried to talk to my in-laws, but they think I simply confused some random weirdo with him. I am absolutely sure it was his voice, his accent. Also, I wrote my boyfriend's aunt about it on WhatsApp, asking if he called at night by accident. I tried to approach her slowly before and open up about the story, and she just effing blocked me without even saying a word. And everyone in the family thinks that's normal somehow. They're like, she's just weird. Don't think about it. She's always a bit weird. Like, what the hell? I didn't do anything. I think that her reaction is clearly proof that I was right. So me and my boyfriend like going out dancing on the weekend, which always ends with us stumbling into our favorite pizza place after joining the taxi queue. We've done this most weekends for over a year now, so have become somewhat friendly with the guys who own the pizzeria. They know us by name, 
and always make a big fuss over us and offer us a discount every time. Now here's where it gets freaky. Last night, a Sunday night at 11 p.m., my boyfriend and I were in bed because we both had work this morning. My phone started ringing, which was weird for that time of night, and I saw it was an unknown number, so I ignored it. Next thing we know, there's someone knocking on the front door. All the lights in the house were off, so we were clearly in bed or not in. I had another call from the same number, and then the person knocking started hammering on the door and flicking the letterbox. My boyfriend got up to answer it, even though I was a bit shaken up and warned him not to. If I had been alone in the house, I never would have answered. So he goes downstairs to answer the door, and lo and behold, it's one of the guys from the pizzeria, holding two freshly cooked pizzas that we didn't order. He said not to tell the other guys at the shop that they were a gift from him to us, his favorite customers. My boyfriend took them from him and thanked him, but we couldn't get back to sleep for hours. We just felt so odd about it. We've ordered from there once for a takeaway, so that's clearly how we got our address and my phone number. But it's still weird, right? someone broke into my nursery when I was a baby. I don't remember this, but my mom told me about it. A couple of months after I was born, my dad went on a business trip and my mom was alone with me in their apartment. She had fallen asleep on the couch and woke up to some loud noises. She rushed into my nursery to check on me. There was an adult man holding me in his arms. After my mom walked into the room, he said, I'm sorry, put me down and walked away. She never saw the man again. I still wonder if he was trying to abduct me, or if he was trying to rob us and just decided to hold me. I worked at a corporate HQ as a receptionist after they announced a very politically divisive celebrity as their new face. This was a very unpopular decision with some people and threats were frequently called into HQ after this ad campaign rolled out. Around this time, I was closing up my building on their main campus one night alone. It was after dark, and I was locking up the desk. For context, this company's HQ is not open to the public, but people don't really know this, and it's common for people to wander in and ask if there's any points of interest to see, because it's an extremely popular brand. Most people coming to the front desk are employees or contractors, or have meetings scheduled. There are turnstiles, and no one can get past reception without clearance. You have to have a reason to be there. If you're wearing a competitor, you can be asked to leave. A man in a gray jumpsuit walked up to my desk and told me he liked to speak with the CEO at the time. Obviously, he couldn't just walk in and immediately speak to the CEO. I asked if he had a meeting scheduled with him. He said he didn't, but he had some business to settle with him and would like to have him sit down and listen to some things that he had to say. This obviously set off immediately red flags. I told him that, unfortunately, only his assistant could set up meetings, and I didn't even know if he was in, etc. The CEO wasn't even in my building, and the brand has hundreds of receptionists, so there was literally nothing I could do. So I just offered every possible excuse and said I could take his contact info. The man then came behind my desk to surveil my computer screen, I could then see he was clearly armed. He spent a few moments arguing that he knew I had the CEO's phone number and office location, to not play dumb, etc. Finally, he leaned over me and told me he was going to step outside for five minutes, and by the time he comes back, it would be wise to have the CEO on the phone, or in the lobby, or that I'd better be ready to walk into his office directly. Fortunately, we have emergency buttons like in a bank. I hit mine and security called my desk. I explained the situation and they went looking for him. I guess when he saw security come out, he took off running through the parking lot, jumped over the landscaping and got away. Security escorted me to my car that night. They pulled the CCTV footage later and when I saw it, it was so creepy to see his body language and proximity to me from another perspective. He had his hand placed where his gun was concealed the whole time. Another creepy thing. Even with his threatening language and demeanor, 
he was smiling and being weirdly flirty in that condescending, scary way the whole time, like trying to be charming so that I wouldn't feel justified escalating things or calling for help, maybe. I am still so unsettled when I think about what could have happened if I made a wrong move during that encounter, or if security wasn't only two buildings over on a campus that spans miles. Every single nerve in my body was telling me that I was in danger, and him running seems to have confirmed that. I was out with my girlfriend late tonight to eat at a dinner when we drove back to my place, which is technically emergency transitional housing for youth who are at risk of homelessness. We parked in front like we usually do to just talk, sometimes for hours, when this creepy man walks by and sits at the stoop that I sometimes sit at to smoke a cigarette late at night. It's off to the side of the complex. He sits there for a few minutes and we pay basically no attention to him. He ends up walking to the car and asking for a smoke through the closed window. And I tell him, sorry, I'm all out. Immediately, I thought it was odd that he knew I smoked and where my spot was. So I locked the door. He stood there staring for a few seconds. And I started saying stuff like, um, can I help you? What do you need? Sarcastically and angrily. He made a let's go over there motion with his head and then came closer to the car like all the way up to the window and I told my girlfriend to drive away but she drove to the opposite side of the street in the same place he then came up to the car again at which point I freaked out and told her to drive away when she did it sounded like the guy threw something at the back of her car that broke made of glass perhaps we circled around for a bit trying to figure out what had just happened and what we should do and we found the guy sitting at a bus stop a block away when we passed by him it seemed like he had his face slightly turned away. We circled again, and he was standing in a dark corner on the opposite side of the street. After about 30 minutes, it seemed like he was gone, and I went inside safely. I told the front desk, and they told me to file a report ASAP, and that they'd be able to review the cameras soon. It just really strikes me as crazy that this guy would attempt to get so close to a car with two people in it, two times in a row, and also throw something, still in a bit of disarray and not sure if this was targeted, an attempted attack or abduction slash trafficking. If anyone can possibly help me piece it together, I'd really appreciate it. So this is actually quite recent, four months ago to be exact. I just want to clarify that English isn't my native language, but I'll try my best to describe the situation. So I, a 22 year old male, was waiting for my turn at the clinic with my mother. We were supposed to be next in line to go in after the patient that was already with the doctor at the time. However, that person was there for so long, almost two full hours. That's when I just had a weird feeling that something bad might happen. While we were still waiting outside, all of a sudden, a teenage girl walked in the door with her mother who was coughing blood and looked to be in a really bad shape. Couldn't walk on her own, bloodshot eyes, bruises all over her body. The girl then asked us, there were like three middle-aged women in there, and an old man, in addition to me and my mom, if someone could help her mom. One of the other women that were waiting for us explained to her that this isn't a hospital, and that the clinic doesn't have the proper equipment to help her mom. Then someone else told her that there's a hospital nearby with emergency services and gave her its name and location. We then quickly started gathering some money for her before they went. All that while, the mom was still bleeding on the couch near us. Once I tried handing her the money, her mom, who didn't speak a word until then, pointed at me and screamed with all the blood coming out of her mouth. It really spooked me for some reason. It sounded like one of those animal screams that you hear when an animal gets severely hurt. Once the girl had collected enough money, I then asked her who told her to come here in the first place. She said, the janitor, 
the short man by the building's entrance, which was super weird since the janitor that we just passed by before we used the elevator and went into the doctor's office was a strikingly tall man and he's always the one there. But of course I didn't think of that then. Anyway, she got the money and was leaving with her mother. I tried helping the girl, but as soon as the mother saw me, she started screaming her lungs out again. This time she was crying as well while still pointing at me. The girl asked the old man to help her get her mom downstairs instead. At that point, the patient that was with the doctor had finally gotten out. I immediately went in. Just about 15 minutes when I was with the doctor, we heard that agonizing scream again. I was still super creeped out from what happened before, but I brushed it off. When I was done with the doctor, I got out of the room and asked one of the women that were waiting there what that scream was, and why did they come back again? She said, they came back shortly after when they couldn't find a taxi outside. Then she said, the poor woman was shouting nonsense. When I said like what, she said, she said something along the lines of, where is he? Why is he hiding from me? Again, there were only two males in there. I was in the doctor's office while the old man was still outside. Then the old man went out with them and got them a taxi. When I discussed that with my mother when we got home, she suspected that it was all a hoax by the girl and her mother to scam people for charity. I still don't know for sure if that was the case or not to this day, but that woman's look and scream while pointing at me still gives me the creeps. My family raises cattle, and we live out in a rural area. My uncle, one, works at a dairy, and is given permission to bring any leftover remaining cow feed for my family's cows. On Saturday evening, he came home, and my other uncle, two, and mom were outside waiting for him while he drives in and parks the truck. Our cows are beside the road near our mailbox, so uncle number one can hear what is going on. The other vehicle, parks in front of the road near our cows and my other uncle too thinking it was our new landowner neighbor starts a conversation with him and turns out it's not him the man claimed his boss instructed him to follow my uncle one home to see where the cow feed is going however uncle one is given permission and every supervisor at his dairy knows this uncle one told the man about his agreement regarding the feed and that he will call his boss to back up the agreement the man does not want Uncle One to call his boss. The man then starts asking about our other neighbors who live across the road and also own cattle and who owns that. He eventually demands that we load a hay bale on his vehicle and Uncle Two says no. Eventually he starts asking more questions and making my family uncomfortable and Uncle Two tells him that if he does not leave he'll call the cops. He starts getting agitated and said that there's no need for that. He kept changing details about who he was and Uncle One did a motion with his hands as if he were writing down license plate numbers. And after we said we're going to call the police, the man sped off. When Uncle One was recalling his route home, he said he remembered seeing that vehicle coming out of a different dirt road and not his job. The other truck probably saw the cow feed and followed him to our home, and Uncle One didn't think too much of the vehicle, since the person could have been someone who lives near us, or someone our neighbors know. We believe he may have wanted to steal from us, and that he is probably stealing livestock from others. He also appeared to be under the influence, as his eyes were bloodshot red. I'm a female, and when I was 18, I had a weird experience with an old man that still sticks in my mind, decades later for its strangeness. I started to write about it, but then thought, why not let my teenage self tell the tale? I was able to search my old online journal, shout out to Diaryland, and find the entry about the creepy guy I nicknamed Bozo, because that's what showed up on our caller ID whenever he called, although admittedly, it was probably a longer name caught off by the caller ID. 
I had to copy and paste and erase a bunch of funky formatting. So apologies if the funk carried over. Anyways, this is my first entry here. So thanks for reading. Here we go. 8-19-2022. Some smiley old man just came to the door to help us with the new floor we're putting in the kitchen. For some reason, my family only hires elderly independent men to do all of our home construction. This is fine by me, as I don't really involve myself too much in the projects around our house. But sometimes the workers get to me. The last guy, for instance. I seriously think his last name was Bozo. Anyway, he was as sweet as pie and shuffled around gassing millions of ants that had infested our house earlier this year. But unfortunately, he talked both ears off whenever you ran into him and was mildly and confusingly flirtatious. Once I came home from school during this week-long tenure at our house, he was in the garage standing aimlessly. He apologized profusely for scaring me, which he didn't. I had seen him and waved from a block away and smiled his crinkly old smile. At this point, I hadn't realized the power of his old man ramblings, and so I stopped the chat. Anyone who's ever been in high school knows how exhausted and dirty you feel after it lets out for the day. You just want to go and lie down on your bed for at least five minutes before you start working again. So, as five minutes turned into ten with Mr. Bozo, I began to get a little impatient and tired. We were still standing in the garage, me with a giant heavy backpack, and he with one finger in the air, telling me about some song with my last name in it. You know the mistress of the song? The one that lived on Blank Mountain? I'm a little afraid of Google Hits. Was a beautiful girl just like yourself? He went on, leaving me with absolutely no way to accept that awkward compliment. Finally, I blurted out that I needed to go to the bathroom and bobbed with difficulty into the house. In the bathroom, I felt like a soldier that had just escaped enemy fire. The man was releasing bullets of anecdotes faster than I could fakely react to them. After staying in there for a few minutes, I only heard faint rustlings from somewhere in the house and assumed that he had gone back to work. So I went in my room to relax. All I wanted to do was put on fresh, clean socks. This had for some reason formed in my mind as the most luxurious thing to do after school. So I peeled off my old ones and sat in the middle of my floor, unrolling and rolling back up my socks on my feet. All of a sudden, Mr. Bozo was in my doorway. He waited until I had made eye contact with him, and then he pretended to stumble backwards a little bit with shock. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, miss. I didn't mean to catch you like this, he exclaimed. I stared. I had one sock still in my hand, and yeah, a foot was exposed, but I was fully clothed. Um, that's okay. I was just putting on socks. I tried to reassure him as I quickly put the other one on. I was wondering, through my shock and amusement, what the hell he needed to be doing in my bedroom. Mr. Bozo went on. I, I only wanted to tell you that I would be in the kitchen. Your door was open, so I thought I could pop my head in and speak to you. I didn't know. It's really okay. They're only socks. This was getting repetitive. I mean, I would hate to have come in and found you naked or something. He continued, not looking at me anymore. At this point, I laughed nervously, agreed even more nervously, and said I had to get back to my homework. So you can imagine why, when I see the newest guy come in from the geriatric ward to start fixing our roof or floor, I become a little cautious. This really happened in Israel long ago. It involves an elevator. The hotel we were staying at had elevators. I was about 11 at the time. I'm a boy. There was this girl that I had always seen playing on the elevator and pressed the really high floor numbers. I decided I was going to try it myself one time because it looked really fun. I pressed the highest floor button, R for roof. I got off and it was a metal room with no chairs. But when I looked at the elevator buttons to go back down, you needed a key to press the button. I was horrified. I was crying frightened and hysterical, and said I have a plane to catch tomorrow. When I was near the elevator door, a while later, I don't know how long, 
that same girl came up and I got on. She saved my life. I asked her when she went up to those floors, how did she get back down? I told her you needed a key to press the button. She told me, oh, I just press all those buttons and go to the floors, but I don't get off the elevator on those floors. When I told my sister about it, she just sang, a blank on the roof. He's up there day and night, instead of a fiddler on the roof. I don't want to include my real name, less chance of someone figuring out who I am. Also on that trip, we saw Elizabeth Taylor riding by in a car. She was visiting Israel when we were there. Yes, this really happened. I'm pretty sure it was 1975. So this was a while ago. I think I was in 8th or ninth grade. I was walking home from the bus stop, which is just at the beginning of my street, because it's a dirt road and the bus can't go down it. The road I lived on only had about four or five people living on it, and my parents and grandparents have lived on this road for generations. Everyone knew everyone. I'm about halfway to my house when a tan van starts coming up the hill. I move to the side so they can pass by but instead they slow down on the side of the road and stop. Then the lady rolls down the passenger side window, which is the side of the car I'm facing, and leans as far in as she can, and holds out her hand and asks me if I know whose ring this is. I've never seen this woman. I've never seen this car. And most of all, she wasn't even holding anything in her hand. I looked at her for a second and I didn't move closer, because I was already freaked out, and then I said no, sorry. Then she said I should come closer to get a better look. I already knew she wasn't holding anything in her hand, so I obviously didn't move. I then said sorry, I don't know whose that is, and just stood there. She looked at me for a second, rolled up the window and drove away. Then I walked home and didn't think about it again. Only until a couple of years ago did I realize that she was probably planning on abducting me. Or it was just some kooky old lady. Just after 1 a.m., I was sat in my living room watching Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, browsing Reddit, the most boring Saturday night ever. And then someone starts knocking. I live with my brother, and there's a guy who visits him sometimes, so I assumed it was him and just opened the door. And there was a random man in his 40s looking kind of sus, saying, sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm looking for a taxi place. So I said town center, and he just keeps apologizing asking if he woke the kids. He's also very close to my door. I don't have any kids, but I said yes, hoping he'd F off. I was scared that if I tried to close the door, he'd push in. I got so anxious, I started shaking. And he goes about that taxi again and says, can I ask you a question? I got divorced yesterday. You're beautiful. And a car was coming, so I said thanks. You know, I tried to be polite so he wouldn't get angry and aggressive and shut the door, and I just stood by the window to make sure he was gone. Jesus, how was I so stupid? It could have ended badly, especially since I live in a crappy area, and my brother wears headphones all the time. Why was he asking about kids? To see if I was alone? And he went in the direction the car was coming. So I don't know if it was a random car or someone picked him up. Was he a thief or just drunk and I had the lights on, so he knocked? I really hope it's just that. I really hope I start thinking before doing anything. Edit. For the people mentioning that I should get a weapon, if you mean a gun, it's not an option where I live. Also, it was nice to get it off my chest, even though y'all did not make me feel any safer. Thank you for the kind comments and tips.
I'm almost 30 now, and I only just realized recently that a man possibly tried to attempt to abduct me when I was a child. I was watching a creepy video on YouTube, and it suddenly hit me that I was in a very similar situation, and never understood the severity until that moment, over 15 years later. I grew up in a very small town of about a thousand people. There wasn't much to do, so my friends and I spent a lot of time walking in the spring and summer months. The town was small, but Route 2 runs right through it, and it's a highway that is the northernmost east-west major U.S. highway, spanning 2,571 miles. It was, and is, a quiet town, but you definitely see some out-of-state cars passing through. When I was about 13 or 14 years old, I was walking along Route 2 to go to my best friend's house. There was a wide spot off to the side of the road where I was and a man on a blue motorcycle with a matching helmet pulled into it. I could only see his eyes through the helmet. He seemed kind and had a nice, non-threatening sounding voice. He seemed young. If I had to guess, I would say that he was in his 20s or early 30s at the latest. I remember our conversation very well, even though I haven't given it much thought over the years. I remember being very flattered and naive. When he pulled in, he asked me where the nearest bridge was, and I told him there was one about seven miles north in the next town over or about 20 miles back from the direction he came from. He thanked me and proceeded to tell me how pretty I was and asked me to take me to lunch. I thanked him for the compliment and told him that I was going to a best friend's house. This went on for quite a long time. I would say every bit of five minutes. He kept telling me how great of a time we would have and that he didn't know his way around and could use my help picking a place to eat. I was trying to be nice, but kept reminding him that I was on my way to a friend's and also saying things like he only had one helmet. He said that I could wear his for the short distance and that he would bring me right back into town after we ate and that it wouldn't be long at all. He only gave up when I pointed out my friend's bright blue house that was about a block away and that she and her family were expecting me any minute. This was kind of truth, but a small lie. She knew that I was coming that day, but I always told my friend that I would walk down after I woke up the next day when we had plans and I never gave her a call to tell her when that would be. I always slept in late during the summer. My friend's mom was always smoking on their porch, but her back was facing my direction, so she didn't see the interaction, but I could see her. She would have been there fighting off this man in a heartbeat if he had actually tried forcing me onto his bike. All I would have to do was yell for her. I thought I was invincible at the time, and so grown up. I thought that I was tough, and that nobody would ever harm me. Like I said, I remember being very flattered, which is so stupid of me. I remember thinking how fun it sounded, and that I would get a ride on a motorcycle for a first time. I actually considered getting on the stranger's bike, because I thought I could take on anything, and that it sounded exciting. The only reason that I didn't go was because I knew how angry my parents would be if they found out. I now know that my parents wouldn't have been angry at all, but relieved if I had actually gone and made it back. It's funny how you process things at a young age. Regardless... I am so happy that I didn't want to make them mad. It could have saved my life. Looking back, there was no way that he didn't think I was a child. I was still in my awkward stage and looked very much like my age at the time. What freaks me out looking back is that he asked me how to get to the nearest bridge and wanted me to go with him in that direction and that he was so persistent. He could have been out of the state in seven minutes and nobody would have even realized that I was gone until much later that day. At the time of this encounter, I was a 24-year-old female, and this happened at my previous job. Howard was a senior in my team. One day, during chit-chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him, as I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances. I recommended some, and then he asked me to help him buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying for colognes, but he said many times that I buy my recommendation for him, so eventually I did. After I bought it, I WhatsApp him the receipt. He texted me back, thanks. I'll treat it as a gift from you, LOL. He did pay me back later, so I thought he was just making a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to go grab a drink after work another day as he noticed I was frustrated at work lately. 
He also said that I could invite more people if I wanted. So I invited Kate, my closest friend in the company, who also was on Alfred's team. Kate suggested me to invite one more colleague, as she believed it was better to hang out in a group of four. I think for a bit and invited Howard, as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy all of us drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague, Aiden, together, regularly after work. So that was the first time I hang out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I live in the same direction. I knew he lived near stop A from previous chit chat, which is 10 stops before my stop. I live quite a far away from the subway station, one hour walking distance. So I planned to take a taxi after getting off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started to say things that made me uncomfortable. For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had ever been to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close with Aiden, and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all those questions. But I thought to myself, it's just a few more stops till stop A. I'd have my peace soon. Howard didn't get off at stop A. I asked him about it, to which he replied that he had some errands near stop B tomorrow morning, so he'd be staying at a friend's near stop B. Stop B is just one stop before my stop. Luckily, Howard shut up soon, probably because of my lack of response. So I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and offered to take a taxi together. He said he'd drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense as these two drop-off points are in completely opposite directions of the subway stop. So I declined by saying I planned to walk home. He didn't know where I live. Then he offered to walk me home. I said it's an hour away and persuaded him to just get a taxi outside my subway stop. He finally budged and called a taxi through the app, which shows the estimated fare. I overheard him mummering the mount, which was definitely more than traveling from subway stop to stop B, more like traveling to stop A. I suspected the stay at his friend thing was a lie all along just to follow me home. A week later, Kate told me that she overheard Howard insinuating to Alfred that we were in a relationship. We were in a profession where relationships between staff are required to be reported and spouses cannot work on the same team. I was creeped out by Howard, but didn't bring it up to Alfred, as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of other people he previously worked with to dinner to celebrate the end of a project. After the meal, Alfred asked me where I was heading to, as he knew that I have two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I told Alfred I'm going back to the apartment in the same direction of Kate's, which was in the opposite direction of Howard's. Howard joined in the conversation and said he's going to that direction too, as a friend was hosting a party there. Kate and I were doubtful shortly. On the subway, Kate asked him where was the party, and Howard replied stop C, which was exactly my stop. So Kate and I pretended we had other places to hang out, and I was not getting off at stop C. Howard got off at stop C, eventually, and I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back to stop C. I avoided him as much as possible before I could quit my job since then. So it was summer of 2012. I was 30 at the time and I had gotten off of work that Friday afternoon. Typical evening came along for me. Went out to go to the local tavern and I always cut up through the park. Well, I was walking through the park. I came across this guy that was sitting on one of the park benches and I walked past him. Mind you all, I have never once seen this guy in my life. And as I walked past him, and as I did, he said my name and asked me how I was doing. So I looked at the guy and something right off the bat seemed to be off about this guy. His smile seemed off. The vibe in general just didn't feel right. So I said to the guy, um, hey, I'm sorry, but do I know you? Have we met before? And avoiding my question, he asked me again how I was. So I said to the guy, I'm good. Thanks for asking and walked away. Well, as I walked away and looked back, 
He still had that smile on his face. I went to the tavern for a bit and came back to my neighborhood, and on the corner by my house was that same guy. So as I walked past him, he started giving me that disturbing smile and greeted me saying my name. So I didn't say anything back, but instead of going through my front door, I walked around the block at the top of my alley and walked down to my backyard. I went through my back door to get in my house. I had trouble sleeping that night and would look out the front window with the lights off from time to time to see if he was still there, and eventually, around 2 a.m., he was gone. Paranoid. Maybe. But if you had seen the guy, you would know that something was off about him. I'm a transgender male. At the time, I was 18 and passed fairly well. I was dating someone online, on and off, for like a year and a half, and finally saved up enough money to get a Greyhound bus pass to get from where I'm from to where she lives. And it was about 16 hours with a few bus switches. One of the bus stops was in Ohio, Cincinnati to be exact. This is my first time being out of my state ever, and my first time ever taking a bus besides school buses, and I was alone. I'm a short guy around five foot two. It was probably around four to five a.m., I believe, when we arrived in Ohio. I sat down at a little cafe area until my next bus, but then this dirty, scrawny dude with a random license plate sits across from me. He made a little small talk, then literally asked if he could pay me for pleasure. I'm freaking out already. And at this point, I kind of freeze and look at the people next to me in hopes that they'll help. I obviously tell the guy no, and then he asks if he can sell me then. At this point, I get up and basically run as far into the crowd as I can and call my dad. The guy disappears and I don't see him again. The messed up part is this. I finally get to the girl, and she tells me her dad had a heart attack. It ended up being a lie, and I have to go. But I had spent my money besides for food and water, on a taxi to get from the last bus stop to her city, which wasn't cheap, and then had to give her friend gas money to take me back to the bus stop. I didn't have enough for a room, and my dad couldn't afford to wire me any to get a room for the night, so I had to sit at a bus stop literally until 8 p.m. for the next bus, because it was a smaller town, and part of it, I had to sit outside because the bus station closed. It honestly was one of the scariest and most terrible times I have ever experienced. This is my first story here. I'm newer to Reddit, so bear with me. This happened last year sometime. I'm a small guy and I'm married. We live in a sketchy apartment complex. But anyway, we're sleeping one night and out of nowhere someone starts pounding on our door and it's like 2 a.m. We both wake up shocked and a little scared because neither of us really have any close friends or family here because we both are kind of antisocial and the people we do have would call or text multiple times before just showing up. Also, at the time, we don't have a peephole and we are the only people with a white door instead of red. So when we have new people come over, we tell them that. We don't answer the door, but I do grab a kitchen knife just in case. They keep pounding on the door for a good five minutes, while also sometimes trying to turn the handle to get in. When they finally stop and leave, we watch them from our window, and they get in this white SUV slash van kind of thing. We still have no idea who it was, but I still think about it sometimes. When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day, this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started talking to me at the register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it, and he asked if it was short for anything. I said yes and told him my full name. He asked what kind of name it is. 
my full name originates from a Greek name. So I told him that because it's kind of interesting. He asked if I've ever been to the Greek festival in my city. I said no. And he replied with, well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point I am 16 and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up to the coffee shop every day and ask my coworkers when I would be coming in or if I was coming in that day. Eventually, he would start sitting at the seat right by the front door waiting for me to get in. One day, he physically stood up and blocked my path and asked if he could buy me a coffee. Yes, at the coffee shop I worked at. And then grabbed my hand. When I declined and tried to walk past to go in the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room. He would hang out there for hours just watching me and would try to constantly talk to me. My managers eventually had to tell me to work in the back until he left every day and then he started sitting in the seat closest to the back room. After that, I had to start coming into work through the back door and staying there until he left. My coworkers had to tell him I quit, hoping he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls, and the cycle started all over again. He truthfully didn't seem that harmful, except for the time he grabbed my hand, but it was creepy, and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end, because no matter what we did or told him, it didn't stop, and he was there just watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order. He was allowed in the plaza the coffee shop was in still, just obviously not in the coffee shop, and not near the patio by the front door. And we usually saw him go to the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. Very creepy, and kind of scary as a 16-year-old girl. A few years ago, I lived in a large apartment complex. My unit was at the very end on the first floor. A lot of strange people lived there, but they seemed pretty harmless. One night, my boyfriend was over, thankfully, and we were watching a movie. I noticed a shadow pass by the window, but then I felt like it didn't completely pass by. At that point, I start feeling like I'm being watched, and I'm too scared to turn and look. I finally look and see the silhouette of a person and a pair of eyes peeking in between the space and the blinds. I told my boyfriend someone was out there, and he jumped up and we saw the person's shadow run away. My boyfriend peeks out the window, and we assume he ran around the back of the building. A few minutes later, there was a knock on my door. My boyfriend and I just kind of look at each other, because it's like 1 a.m. I told him not to answer it, because I don't want to open the door to anyone. After a minute of discussion, he's adamant on answering it so I tell him to grab a knife. He opens the door and thought no one was out there. He looked over and saw a man behind a nearby tree doing the come here motion with his hands. We called the cops and they said they would keep an eye out, but we never heard anything more. In the moment, it felt like the beginning of a scary movie. For context, I'm 29 about to turn 30 in a couple of weeks, and to this day, I'm still creeped out when I recall this incident. I'll try my best to keep this as concise as possible. When I was much, much younger, maybe seven or eight years old, my family went to a Target about a half an hour away to the west of my smaller hometown to shop. My dad is a pretty nonchalant guy and had a habit of just walking away from me or my sister if we were taking too long checking out the makeup aisle or looking at toys. This was meant to be a motivator to stick by him. I promise he's not a jerk. So anyway, I was in my own little world looking at different lip glosses or something and suddenly realized my dad was nowhere to be seen. I wasn't very concerned as I mentioned before. He'd often wander away from me while shopping. I began to look around for him and noticed an older man who was alone and who without a doubt noticed me and that I was alone. I had been a rather precocious child and very perceptive Immediately, I had a bad feeling about this man. As I continued searching for my dad, calling out for him, I noticed this man was following me. I grew increasingly uneasy as I still couldn't find my dad 
and it was now very clear to me that this man was trying to get close to me. Every aisle I looked down, the man was at the end of it, keeping up with my every move. Finally, I found my dad in some other grocery aisle, and I immediately ran to him, grabbing his hand and breathing a sigh of relief. Just as I did this, I saw the man's head peer around the end of the aisle we were now in, and seeing that I had finally found my dad and was no longer alone, he quickly ducked back out of the aisle and disappeared. At this point, it was clear to me that he was trying to do something with me, because I remember the look of pure anger on his face when he realized I had found my chaperone slash father. The rest of the time in the store, I didn't leave his side. I remember it was right around St. Patrick's Day, because my parents allowed me to pick out an item for them to purchase for me, and I chose a green t-shirt that was put out for the seasonal occasion. The shirt was a size too small, because I had been too scared to go into the dressing room alone to try it on. I'm pretty sure the shirt said lucky or something like that. Looking back, definitely appropriate given what I had just experienced. I never told my dad what had happened. I'm not sure why. Maybe I thought I would be in trouble. I was just relieved to have found him when I did, because there was no doubt in my mind at the time that I was seconds away from being taken by this man. When I was growing up, my family became close to a very wealthy middle-aged man who was also close with some other kids' families at my school. I think it was about seven when I met him. It was a repeated pattern that he would get close to with kids' parents, then get close with the kids, hyper-focus on them, have a falling out with the parents, and then move on to the next family. This may sound dangerous, but nothing ever untoward happened, to my knowledge, and I was one of the children he got closest to. I think he was just an emotionally immature man-child who could relate better to children. Still creepy though, which is why I'm posting it here. My family went through the same cycle with him. I got really close to him, more so even than my sister and my friends, whose parents were also friends with him. Looking back, it was really unwise and completely inappropriate, and my parents have admitted that it was and apologized. But I was allowed to sleep over at his house by myself or just with a couple of friends. Why a grown man would agree slash want to hang out with a seven-year-old girl is also beyond me. Eventually, this man's erratic behavior drove my parents and me away. I think the final straw was when he yelled at my mother for wanting me to spend the holidays with family instead of him. While all of this alone is creepy enough, the alarming behavior continued after the falling out. For several years afterwards, on holidays and my birthday, presents would be left on our doorstep for me. One year for my birthday, he got a very expensive piece of equipment and had my name painted onto it. Luckily, it stopped after about three years, but it was still very creepy. A few years later, my mother saw him with another family and with a young girl on his shoulders. It seems that that behavior continued. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I really appreciate it. I hope that you have an excellent night of sleep, and please enjoy the rain at the end. Have an excellent night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.